will be what will do what I have been doing, and you do even greater things than this, because I'm going to the Father, and I will do whatever you ask in my name, so that the Son may bring glory to the Father. You may ask me for anything in my name, and I will do it. If you love me, you will obey my command, and I will ask the Father, and he will give you another counselor to be with you forever the spirit of truth. The world cannot accept him because it neither sees him nor knows him. But you know him, for he lives with you and will be in you. I will not leave you as orphans. I will come to you. Before long, the world will not see me anymore. But you will see me because I live and you also will live. On that day, you realize that I am in the Father and that you are in me, and I am in you. Whoever has my commands and obeys them, he is the one who loves me. He who loves me will be loved by my Father, and I will love him and show myself to him. Then Judas, not Judas Iscariot, said, But Lord, why do you intend to show yourself to us and not to the world? Jesus replied, If anyone loves me, he will obey my teaching. My father will love him, and we will come to him and make our home with him. He, he who does not love me will not obey my teaching. These words you hear are not of my own. They belong to the father who sent me. I think we'll stop there. Now, um, John chapter 14 is, uh, is in a sense a continuation of the events that have been progressing throughout the book. Jesus Christ, uh, at this stage from about uh, chapter 13, 14, and so on, he is with his disciples, and more or less there are some of his last moments with them, and uh, uh, he's saying to them, look, a time is coming shortly when I must die, uh, and I will go away to the Father, and you remain alone, but you will not be alone. And this is what he says, is that, look, it is necessary for me to go to the Father. Then I will send another who is the comforter or the counselor, or in Greek they call it the paraclete, okay, who is coming to stay with you and walk with you. Uh, so do not let your hearts be troubled. Because evidently when Jesus was speaking, his disciples, in a sense, were feeling disillusioned and discouraged and feeling sad that he who had led them this far, the, the previous three years, and had taught them the way to live, was sadly about to go. And so there was a sense in which they were discouraged. And so Jesus says in verse 1, do not let your hearts be troubled. Trust in God and trust in me also. And then he explains what he is, why he's going ahead. It is to open, uh, would I say, to prepare a place for them. But that's not my, uh, the, my consideration this morning. My, my, my consideration this morning, before we look at the book of John, is just, uh, I'm, I'm cognizant that we live in what is known as a pluralistic day or a pluralistic society. I didn't use this word earlier on. By pluralistic, we mean uh, we live in a context where people believe that there's not just one right thing, but there are many ways. So with respect to religion, we're saying there's a plurality of gods, a pantheon of gods. In other words, uh, Christianity is just one of the many religions on the in the spectrum. So you can pick and choose uh, what you think is good and works for you. So when you begin to say, look, Christianity is the only way. Christianity is the truth that takes one to heaven. They say, ah, excuse me, excuse me. Uh, for you, Christianity works. So don't impose your Christianity on me. What works for you may not work for me. 
One, one man's meat, as that's what they say, is another man's poison. So there's a way in which we live in a pluralistic society. And what I see increasingly, even in this country, in Zambia, is that we are going to come to a stage where we will not be able to assert that Christ is the only way to the Father. Christ or Christianity is the only way that we can get saved. Why? Because uh, of pluralism, uh, which is caused or lives or buttressed by what is known as postmodernism. So I'm saying in a pluralistic day, many claim to be solutions to, uh, to life's struggles, uh, challenges, and so on. They, 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 they offer, they, plan, they claim to offer ways to get to heaven. But also they offer ways to sort out our problems, uh, so to speak. And so um, there are many ways that this comes out, as we shall see this morning. But the question I'm asking this morning, and that's where that brings us to our verse of consideration, is this one question. What does the Bible say or teach about uh, the way to heaven? What does the Bible say? And we'll discover what the Bible says. Let's turn uh, to that passage that we read, John chapter 14, and I'll, I'll read from verse 5, although the verse that we will focus our minds is verse 6 and 1. Okay, now this is what the Bible says. Thomas said to him, Lord, we don't know where you are going, so how can we know the way? Then the Bible says, and Jesus in responding to, to Thomas, he says, Jesus answered, I am the way and the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. That's verse 6. Jesus answered, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. There are three things that I want us to observe, three major things. Of course, there will be other sub-points that we shall look at, but three major sub-points. Uh, you know, that's a major point with sub-points. And Jesus is responding to Thomas uh, as they are having this discourse. I, I would like to imagine they are having uh, the Lord's Supper, they are talking, and these are the final words that Jesus is saying to his disciples. And I would like to believe that it was a very, very tense atmosphere as they sat in that upper room as they are talking. And Jesus is with his disciples. And, and as he is talking to them, he is not only uh, telling them that, you know, you need to wash each other's feet because I, your master, have washed your feet. You must wash each other's feet. Now, uh, when Jesus is doing that in John chapter 13, uh, he, he, is, he washes his feet. As he washes the feet, oh, sorry, their feet, as he washes the feet of disciples, when he reaches Peter, Peter says, ah, no, not me. You can't wash my feet. Uh, naturally, uh, Peter, I think, was impulsive. And he said, no, 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 no. no you, you can't do that to me. Jesus says, look, uh, I have to wash your feet. Because if I don't, then you're not part of me. I said, ah, okay, then you just wash the whole of me. Then Jesus says, no, no, no. You're not getting the import of what I'm saying. And so he washed their feet. And after he finishes washing their feet, he's, he asks them this question in verse 7 of chapter 13. Let's read that together. Chapter 13 and verse 7. You do not realize, you do not realize now what I'm what I'm doing, but later uh, you will uh, realize. He's talking to Peter, of course. And then, so, uh, uh, no, said Peter, you shall never wash my feet. Jesus answered, unless I wash you, uh, you have no part 
with me. Uh, then Simon Peter uh, says, Lord, not just my feet, but my hands and my head as well. Now notice uh, Jesus answered and, and then he tells them uh, in verse 12, when he had finished washing their feet, he put on his clothes and returned to his place. Do you understand what I have done to you? He asked. You call me teacher or master or rabbi and Lord, and rightly so, for that is what I am. Now that I, your teacher or your Lord, has washed your feet, you should also wash one another's feet. I have set you an example that you should do as I have done to you. I tell you the truth, no servant is greater than his master. And then he continues. Jesus teaches what is known as servant leadership. Okay, that, uh, you know, you are the leader and yet you are the servant. Um, uh, at least in that, when they're having that discussion, that's what Jesus does. And then at some point, as, as they are talking, he says, look, today or at some point, one of you will betray me. And they're saying, hmm, is it I, Lord? Is it I, Lord? Although John records that Simon Peter again nudges John and says, ask him, who, who is it? You know, and so on. Uh, and, and John, who is called the disciple whom Jesus loved, asks the Lord. Uh, and, and of course, Jesus responds. But in chapter 14, they're still around the Lord's table. It's a very tense and sad moment. I don't know if you have been around the deathbed of somebody who is about to die. They're very sick, and usually in our culture, uh, if it's an old person, uh, and maybe their parents or what, they would like to call all their children uh, and, and bring them and say, hey, everybody come. And then they were speaking words to them. The children usually would take those words very, very seriously. And yet, at the moment, as they are seeing life ebbing out of those that they love, it is something that is very sad. And, and, and in a sense, that's what the disciples are feeling here. They're feeling powerless. They're feeling discouraged. And, and Peter is even saying, you know, I'll, I'll die with you. Jesus said, Peter, you will deny me three times. Our debts. I don't know if he was using them, but it's most like debts. You know, I'll be with you to the very end. And when things happen, what happens? Matt is the first guy to run away and denies him three times. But let's come to verse 6 that I've talked about. As Thomas is asking, uh, we don't know the way. How can you say that we know the way? Show us the way. And Jesus says, Thomas, I am the way. I am the very way that you are asking for. For you to know where I'm going to be, where I'm going to be, I am that way. I am the way. I am the truth. I am the life. And in a sense, Jesus, when he's making those uh, claims three times over, you can argue that he is saying the same thing, but in different ways. Well, that could be true, but I would like to argue that Jesus is emphasizing something that is very, very fundamental with each of those three things that he says. Okay? First of all, you notice that when Jesus says, uh, I am the way, I am the truth, I am the life, he is making what are known as exclusive claims. By exclusive claim, we mean Jesus is saying that think of anything else. There is no way that you can get to the Father but through me. I am the way. I am the only way. I am the one who gets you to where I want you to be. Jesus says, I am not one among many saviors. I am not among many prophets. I am not one among many other people that claim. I am the ultimate. I am the only savior. That's what Jesus is saying. 
In a day when people say, look, Christianity is one of the many. We can believe in this religion or that religion. I can believe in Christ and then also have a bit of this and the other. Jesus is saying, no! If you are going to come to God, if you are going to know God, you must come through me. So you can guess my response to that question. What does the Bible say about getting to heaven? Jesus says, it is through him alone. Well, before I go further, let me just say this, that when we read the book of John, which was written by the Apostle John himself, the disciple whom Jesus loved, he, um, he uses the phrase, I am, several times across the book itself. And here are some examples uh, that I want you to observe. First of all, you see that in John 8, uh, verse 12, we won't have time to look at it, but let's turn to it for the sake of interest. Let's go to John chapter 8 and, and verse 12. Uh, there, you notice that um, that phrase, I am, is, is used. Okay, when Jesus, verse 12, spoke again to the people, he said, I am the light of the world. Whoever follows me will never walk in darkness, but will have life, the life, the light of life. But then also in John chapter 6, verse 35 and 51, there we see Jesus saying that I am the bread of life. I am the bread of life. In other words, there are many other things that you may claim, but I am that bread of life that you need to eat to have eternal life. But elsewhere, Jesus says uh, that I am the vine in John chapter 15, verse 1. I am the vine. Let's, let's turn to that one. At least we will see it. Jesus says, I am the true vine and my father is a gardener. And then in verse 5, he says, I am the vine. Jesus uses the word I am several times. John chapter 10 verse 7, he calls himself I am the gate to the sheep pen. You, all other avenues are not there. I am the gate. So whoever comes through other means is a thief and a robber. I am the genuine entrance to this place where you find the sheep. But there are other uses that uh, John uses the word I am. Um, in, in, in John chapter 8, for instance, uh, when Jesus uh, is talking with the Pharisees or let's say some people are arguing, then, 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 then he says to them, before Abraham was, I am. And now the Jews get very upset and pick stones and want to stone him. And the reason why they want to stone him is that Jesus is using a phrase that we find in the Old Testament, most likely in Exodus chapter 3. You know when Moses is around the, the, the burning bush, uh, and he says, what is your name? He's asking God. What, who should I say sent me? And then God says, go and tell them, I am that I am. And when Jesus says, before Abraham was I am, he is saying, I am the eternal one. I am the pre-existent God. I am God, true God. You just need to read the passage. They pick stones and they want to stone him. And when he asks, why do you want to stone me? He says, you, a mere man, claim to be God. I am. So it can be used in different words. But let's come, wait, let's come to John chapter 14. And um, verse 6, Jesus answered, I am the way. So Jesus, in saying those words three times over or several times over, when he says, I am, he is pointing to himself. 
He is not saying, he is not talking about a second or a third person. He is talking about himself. So whatever he is going to say in verse 6, he is saying, I am what I claim to be. Forget about all these others. But I am the one that you must believe. So then we are saying that when Jesus says this, when he's answering Thomas, uh, by way of answering, he is saying that, you know, you have asked a very important question. But this is the answer. Pay particular attention to it. And I would like to uh, urge all of us that are listening uh, and uh, those that are following us on uh, Facebook and so on, that when Jesus is saying, I am the way, he is responding and saying that, you see, I am actually the way that you're saying you don't know. So how can you claim that you don't know the way? Because I am the way where you want to go. So if you know me, that means you have the way. You know the way. You know where to go. I have the words of eternal life. I am the way itself. So there are several things that uh, we need to get from that passage. When Jesus says, I am the way, he is saying that he is the way. He doesn't say, I am a way. Because if you say, I am a way, it carries a connotation of the idea is that there are several other avenues, isn't it? When you say, I am a way to the Father, he is saying that it might mean that, look, there are many ways to get to the Father, and I am one of those ways. But that's not what Jesus is saying. Not just what he's saying. He's saying, I am the way. The way is a definite article. Like I said, we live in a pluralistic society where people say that, you know, all of us, all the religions, and whatever it is, we are all trying to get to the mountaintop. To the Father. And we can use different ways to go to the Father. But ultimately all of us will get to the Father. Some use this religion. Others use that religion. Others use that. As long as they're sincere. They're true. And they mean what they say. They, we shall all meet at the mountaintop with the Father. But Jesus says, no friends. I am. I am the way. I am the way. I am the way that you need to pass through if you're going to get to the Father. When he says, I am the way, he is implying that he is the correct path. Okay, there could, could be other paths. They take it different directions. But I am the, 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 the right way, the path that takes us to the Father. Secondly, when he's saying, I am the way, he is saying that he is the route or the route that takes us to the Father. When you get into this way of Christ, you are certainly going to get to the Father. If you are not in Christ, then you are not on this way. But further, when he says, I am the way, he is implying that he is the entry into the Father's presence. His entry into the Father's presence. Because if you don't have Christ, you and I cannot be saved. It doesn't matter how sincere we are. It doesn't matter how many things we have done, good things. It doesn't matter how many religions that we know. It doesn't matter how sincere we are. It doesn't matter even how long we live. If we do not go through Christ, we cannot enter into the presence of God. But when he says, I am the way, he is also implying that he is the gates. Now in ancient times, uh, they would talk about gates and sometimes it would be, so like in Matthew 7, talk about the broad road, eh? and the narrow gate or the narrow road. That's in that sense that Jesus is saying that I am the true gate. 
If you're going to know the Father, if you're going to be in heaven, if you're going to be with Christ, if you're going to be in Abraham's bosom, if you're going to be where God is, you can only access God through Jesus Christ. Only through Christ do we have favor before God. But when Jesus says, I am the way, further, he is implying that he is the only, the exclusive way to the Father. In other words, any other ways that you use outside Christ are false. They cannot take you to the Father. No matter how good they are, no matter how attractive and plausible and, and beneficial they might be even in this life, they cannot take you to the Father. We have people who are teaching, look, let's just be good, let's help the poor, let's do this and that. Although that is important, but that cannot save anybody, no. If you do not have faith in Jesus Christ, if you have never entered through this way, through Christ, through him who gives eternal life, you cannot be saved. You are not saved today. But in the second place, let's move on. Um, that when Jesus says, I am the way, secondly, he says, I am the truth. Okay, if you read it in my version, it says, I am the way and the truth. It, it seems to suggest that he's just adding. But you, you can still say it in this way. That Jesus is saying, I am the way, comma, I am the truth, comma, I am the life, comma. Okay? It depends how you, you know, construct it. But what, that's what Jesus is saying, that not only am I the only way, the true way by which we can enter the throne room of God, but I am the truth itself. In other words, if you're going to have truth, if you're going to get heaven, if you're going to know what it is to be a true child of God, you need to be in Christ. Any truth that is apart from Christ is false. It is not true truth. It is a claim of man. It is something that men and women have concocted and have brought together and they say this is truth. Jesus says no. I am the source of all truth. And I am truth itself. The truth of God is embodied in me. And if you are going to enter heaven, you must buy this truth. And say it not. Proverbs 23, verse 23. Jesus is the wisdom of God. Jesus is the treasure that we must get. And what Jesus is saying, basically, friends, when he says, I am the truth, he is saying that this body of truth that leads to eternal life. This body of truth is found in me. It is not found in any other places. Yes, we have people who say, ah, Bible, you know it was written by men. And the Bible has errors. That's what they teach, isn't it? And Jesus is saying, no. Truth is found in me. And all truth that we have around the world, in whatever form, it has its source in him. But here, particularly, he is talking about the truth that leads to life. In other words, if you're going to have eternal life, you must have this truth. And having this truth is to know Christ. But further, when Jesus says, I am the truth, he is saying that he is the exclusive truth. He is the only truth, he is the exclusive truth, he is a unique truth. 
So if you don't have this truth that God talks about in Jesus Christ, then you cannot be saved. No matter how religious you are, no matter how good you are, kind, gracious, philanthropic, you amaze people with the, the way that you do things. But if you don't have this truth of God in Christ, you're not saved. No. Although I would encourage you to continue doing those things, but what we're urging you is make sure that you have this truth that is found in Jesus Christ. And what are some of the aspects of this truth that we can talk about? We can talk about how Jesus Christ is the Son of God. He is the Savior of the world. He is the one that came and was born among us and he died our death. That you and I, if we believe in him, we shall have eternal life. If you have this truth, you will be saved. And Jesus is saying to Thomas, Thomas, the three years that I've been with you, I am the truth. Don't listen to others. Jesus says, I am the way that takes you to God himself. Jesus is the truth. I could say more, friends, on that uh, claim that Jesus is making. Uh, which I think is very exclusive. Uh, and, you know, when you begin to speak like the way Jesus is speaking, it looks very radical in our day. Some people say, no, 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 no. You're being bigoted. You know, bigoted is you're being strongly opinionated. You think you're the one who knows everything. You think you are the know-it-all. Yeah? And some even say, ah, you know, you think you're... No. Friends, Jesus is very clear. It doesn't mean Jesus is not aware that there are other religions. It doesn't, it doesn't mean Jesus is not aware that there are castles. It doesn't mean he's not even, he doesn't know what is going on in his own immediate context with Judaism. He is aware. But Jesus is saying, name it, whatever it is, all history, all truth, all ways to the Father is found in me. I am the way. I am the truth. Any other claims outside me is false. Many years ago, those of you who have been around, you remember there was um, a gentleman, I think he's from Kitwe, I think he was from Kitwe, who I think was sporting like a beard and wearing, uh, you know, my robes and so on. And he says, oh, I am Jesus. You know, uh, Jesus didn't finish his work, so I have come to, to finish. And uh, I don't know how he was speaking, but he had begun to have a following. The Zambians, of course, uh, were not very happy, and they had him probably arrested or something. Uh, but such people will come, and they will claim that, you know, Jesus Christ did not finish his work on the earth. For example, they will say, Jesus was supposed to marry and he did not marry, but he was killed prematurely. So I have come to come and fulfill that which he did not do. There are people who teach that. And Jesus says, no. Everything that the Father came, gave me to do, I came to do and I have fulfilled. But in the third place, Jesus says the following. He's, he not only says, I am the way, not only he says, I am the truth, but in the third place, he says that I am the life. Notice, he, those are definite articles. I am the life. Not a life, but the life. Meaning, human beings exist and have their being, and live, and move, and have their being extracted from Christ. In other words, Christ is a source of all life in whatever form that you might think of it. Whether it is spiritual or physical life, 
The fact that you and I are moving and able to come into this sanctuary, you are able to listen and, 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 and intercourse and, and, and think as it were, it is because Christ is giving you and I life to exist, to live and move and have our being. But Jesus is saying deeper than that, that he is the source of all spiritual life. Everything that is in our lives, everything that we need for life and godliness, the very existence of our souls, to be like God, to live with him, to be like his children, it is from Christ. I am the life. You know, I'm a bit older now, but before I became a Christian as a young person, you know, feeling very energetic, you, you, you feel, oh, I can do this, you know, today I'll do this, tomorrow I'll do that, uh, with my strength and so on. But as, after I became a Christian, I just realized everything that I have or will ever be comes from God. And so Jesus is saying, sustains you. I am the one that gives you life. I am the one who takes you before the Father that you might be in his bosom. So briefly, what does Jesus mean when he's saying, I am the life? First of all, when Jesus says I am the life, he's saying he is the life itself. Okay? The very life, the very being, the very existence is found in Christ. John chapter 3 verse 16. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. That whoever believes in him should not perish but have eternal life. Jesus says, I am the light of the world. He who walks in me will not walk in darkness but will live in the light of life. Jesus, Jesus is life itself. If you throw away Christ, you have lost your life for all eternity and you will not be in the presence of God. But not only is he life itself, as we have said earlier, Jesus is a giver of life. He is the author. He is the one who gives life into Oh, human beings, eternal life comes from him. John chapter 6, 65. Unless the Father draws you, you cannot come. You cannot come to the Father. I give them life that they might have life. The Father has given them to me. And none shall pluck them from the Father's hands. Christ is the giver of life. In John chapter 5, he talks about how that when he calls the dead in Christ shall rise from their grave and shall respond and come to him. Jesus is the one that gives eternal life. In and of ourselves, we are impotent. We don't have the ability to save or change ourselves. We are dead in our sins. But when we come to Christ, Perhaps we're still lost in our sin. He is the one that regenerates and gives life. And then suddenly, the things that were not exciting become exciting. What has happened? Christ has given life. Before somebody is a Christian, coming to church is just one of those activities. It's like going to the post office. You, you, you buy your stamps or you buy whatever you want. You don't care who, is, who else is in the post office. Even the person who's uh, uh, giving you the service over the counter, you don't really bother to find out their names. Of course, you become interested if they are not as efficient as you would like. But generally, you're not interested. You get your business and you go away. Or oh, going to the market. You buy your stuff and you go away. But when somebody becomes a Christian, suddenly those people that they were not interested in, they become interested. It becomes a family. Because they are the children of God. I don't know what home you come from, but um, 
if your home is a proper home, usually when you wake up, you will want to greet each other, isn't it? Mashuken. I think that's what he's saying then, right? Oh, Mouka Bunch. Mouka. You know, Nyanja. I can see his. Mabuka Wutsu, eh? And so on. So, you know, you, you greet somebody, even if you can see that they are healthy, they are strong, and what. You just want, it's just courtesy. You just want to find out how they are. Why do you do that? It's because there's a sense of belonging. But in a home where people don't greet each other, you begin to wonder whether there's a family. If you wake up in the morning, you're just busy doing your own work and what, what. And if somebody asks you, so how are you? Do you think I'm sick? Can't you see that I'm okay? No, friends. There's a sense of life. And Jesus is saying, when I give you life, you have a sense of belonging. Not only are you mine, but you belong to a family of God. And you love God's children. So Jesus is a giver of life. And I'm asking the question, do you have this life that Jesus gave? Yes, maybe you might be religious, found in the place of worship, but do you truly have this life? Do you have Jesus in your life? Is he Lord? Is he King? I'm not asking, are you sincere? Do you give to the poor? Those are good things, but those cannot save. These days we even have church officers. As long as they, their pocket power is so powerful, they even they given like a position in the church. Eh? Unfortunately, even in evangelical circles, that's happening. Others sing in, in what you call music ministry. Okay, I was, like a phrase I've, 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 I've forgotten. They sing, and even when they're singing, they even cry. <laughs> You know, and so on, and we think, ah, this person, there's no way, and unless they're saved, they cannot be crying like that. Friends, it is possible to behave like that. It is possible to act and yet not have life. And Jesus is saying, you must have life, and life is found in me, not any other. But further, when Jesus says he is alive, he means he is the exclusive giver of this life. In other words, nobody else, nobody else in the universe can give life. No matter how glorious they might be, no matter how educated they might be, no matter how philosophical they might be, no matter how good they might be, if they do not come in Christ, they are liars and robbers. They cannot give you life, eternal life. Let's read one passage, uh, Acts chapter 4, verse 12. Acts chapter 4, verse 12. I rarely go out of the text that I'm preaching from, but I think it's important that we see. Now, the book of Acts records the historical narrative of things as they were unfolding. And the book of Acts covers roughly a period of 30 years when he went. And in Acts 28, you notice it doesn't end, it just continues, right? Eh? So it covers the first 30 years, at least, of the church. Now, Acts chapter 4 and verse 12, the Bible says, Salvation is found in no one else, for there is no other name under heaven given to men by which we must be saved. What is Peter saying? He knows that there could be other ways that people are entertaining. But he makes this statement very clear. If you're going to be saved, if you're going to have life, if you're going to be delivered from the dominion of sin and darkness, you can.
can only find this in Jesus Christ. Salvation is found in no one else except Jesus Christ. And in John chapter 10, verse 7, maybe that we can turn to it. It's within our passage, John chapter 10, within our book. John chapter 10, verse 7. This is what Jesus said. Therefore, Jesus said again, I tell you the truth. I am the gate for the sheep. All who ever came before me were thieves and robbers. But, but the sheep did not listen to them. I am the gate. Whoever enters through me will be saved. He will come in and go out and find pasture. Then notice what he says in verse 10. The thief, what does he do? Comes only to steal and kill and destroy. I have come that you may have life and have it to the full or have it in abundance. So when Jesus says, I am the life, it's me. Too bad. If you don't like me, you just have to come to me. Friends, it is so serious that we must believe in Jesus Christ because he is the only Savior. He's not among many. He is the only. In Hinduism, they have 330 deities, isn't it? Gods and so on. And you can choose which one to believe in. And Jesus is not among the one 330 million. No. He is the only Savior. He is the only life. He is, this is an exclusive claim. That Jesus makes. But how does Jesus give us life? It is through what is known as the redemption. When he dies on the cross. When he dies on the cross. And he is he's crying before the Father. And says Eloi. Eloi. Lama sabachthani. What is he doing? He is paying for your sins and my sins. He is suffering. The son of God for a while. Was forsaken by the Father. And he was punished for your sins. My sin. And there was darkness for three hours. What was happening? We don't know exactly. But I would like to put it to you that Jesus died our death. You and I were supposed to die, but he died and suffered the equivalent of hell for each and every one of us. And on the third day we are told that he rose again. You know, friends, if Jesus did not rise from the dead, you and I would be the most to be pitied. It would mean the Father would not have accepted his sacrifice. But lo and behold, on the third day, up from the grave he arose, of the triumph king, and he rose again, that we might be justified. Romans chapter 5 talks about he rose for our justification, that we might become the righteousness of God. He so it is only through Christ, as he died on the cross, he was paying for our sins. And we have life through his death. Salvation was free, but it was costly, as somebody says. It was free, but it cost the life of the Son of God. God demanded, the soul that sins, it shall die. And, and, and sin must be punished with everlasting the destruction. And Jesus Christ took our sin, took and died in our, your place and my place, that we might have the righteousness of Jesus Christ. He suffered both physically and within his soul. Friends, when Jesus was dying on the cross, it was such a slow, excruciating, painful death. As he is coming to the cross, he has been beaten, he has been spat upon, he has been cursed, he is, he is so dehydrated, he cannot even carry his cross. And so there's this uh, gentleman, uh, I think, or Paramathia, who comes and, uh, and helps him carry his cross. And then he puts it there, and he is, as he is, Getting on the cross, he is nothing but a skeleton with flesh hanging from his flesh. Part of pieces of his flesh are hanging and, and he is dying on the cross. And friends, when Jesus died, he died naked. Can you imagine? The son of God, the creator of the world, died such a shameful death. 
And when people saw him, they said, there's no way a human being can suffer like that. He must have done that something that was very terrible. That's why God is punishing him. And in Isaiah 53 tells us that he was so afflicted. He was so beaten. He was so broken, would I say. Of course, none of his bones were broken. But he, he was so smitten that you could not recognize him. That he was so bad that no one would ever look at him with such an eye and look at him twice. Oh no, he was such a, a despicable figure as it were, as he hung on the cross. And yet the Bible says he was paying not for his own sin but for the sins of you and I. Friends, when Jesus is telling his disciples, he knows what he lies before him in a few hours' time. He's going to die. He's going to pay for the sins of the world. But he says, I must go. Oh, the Father, I'm praying that if it's possible, you might take away this cup, but not my will, but yours. And as he's crying in the garden of Gethsemane, he is sweating as sweat drops of blood, as it were. It was such a serious thing. And yet he had to go through that. And you know when he's dying on the cross, crucifixion was pain. It was slow. And the Romans used it as capital punishment. They only reserved it for those criminals who were really, really bad. And that's where the Son of God was put. And you know, when they would hang those people on the cross, they would put them there. And if it was before the Sabbath, especially in Jewish areas, and if they found the person who was still alive, what they would do is that they would break their legs. Remember they're hanging on the cross, nails here, nails there, uh, and so on. And then the legs also support some, so there was blood that is coming out, blood vessels that have been ruptured. This person is dying and he's also dehydrated. But you know, to accelerate the death, because on the Sabbath day they were not supposed to handle uh, dead bodies. And they were not supposed to remain hanging. So they would come. If they find you're still alive, they'll break your legs. And when they break your legs, you know what happens? There's no support down here. So then your inner linings, the inner organs will kind of collapse. And that's how you die quickly. But it was slow and painful. And Jesus says, I am the if you don't believe in me, you will have to pay the price yourself. Now the difference is that because you're not perfect, you have to pay the price for all eternity in hell. And hell, friends, is real. It's not imagined, it's real. And because you can't pay for your sins, you will have to pay for eternity. Ever and ever and ever. So I'm asking this question, friends, as I come to give the implications, or although I've uh, talked about them already, is that do you believe in this Jesus Christ? Is he your Lord? Is he your Savior? Do you have life that he's talking about? Do you have this truth? Are you on the way? Are you in the way that leads to life? Only Jesus can offer that. So friends, what are the implications of the things that we have said? Although we will talk about the implications, let me just say that when Jesus says, I am the way, the truth, and the life, he kind of comes and now just closes the door. And what does he say? No one can come to the Father. Let's read it together. Uh, together that phrase, uh, verse 6. I am the way, the truth, and the life. And then he says, no one comes to the Father except through me. 
What is Jesus saying there? He is basically sealing and cementing what he has asserted. Here I want to say it's like he's slamming the door and locking and throwing away the key. No one can come to the Father except through me. So that's what it means. It means that uh, by way of implication arising from the second part of that statement, it means that Jesus is the only truth. Secondly, Jesus is the only way. But lastly, Jesus is the only life. All others that claim, no matter how good they are, no matter how fine, logical sounding they might be, they cannot save. But we must say that Jesus is the only mediator who has been appointed between God and man. You go to the cross or to the tomb rather of Jesus, it's an empty tomb. He is not there. He is risen. But the tombs of these other people who have claimed to be saviors, they are still there. And people even venerate, hey, hey, the bones are here and what, what. But Jesus, no. He is risen. He is in glory. Jesus is the only savior. And he is the only one who rose from the dead. But we must say further that Jesus cannot be compared to any others. So perish the thought of people who say, no, Christianity is one of the many. No, friends. Jesus makes a very categorical statement. No one can come to the Father except for me. You cannot compare Christ. And we must say, we must preach Christ relentlessly. We must preach him as long as he gives us breath. Because only him has life. Well, there, there could be many other things that I would say about uh, that passage. But I would like to say as I uh, close and uh, maybe re-ask the question that I asked earlier on. When Jesus says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. And he says further, no one can come to the Father except through me. I ask this question. Is Jesus your Lord and Savior. Yes, you're a good person. But is he your Savior? Is he your Lord? Do you have him as the one that has saved you? Second, are you persuaded that Jesus is the only Savior? Are you persuaded that he is the only Savior? If you're not, I'd like to suggest that you're just playing church. You're not converted. You're a good person, perhaps, but you're not saved. You're playing church. Good person. Nice. But that will never take you to heaven. Jesus says, look, if you're going to head to heaven, you have to come to me. You have to come through me. I am the only Savior. Not any other. I am. I am the only one. Is he the only Savior? Are you persuaded? But lastly, how has your life changed from the day that you became a Christian? Jesus says, if you love me, if you're truly my disciple, you will obey my commandments. You will live my life. My words will not be burdensome. You shall know them by their truth. How is your life in the private place and then the public place? I'm not saying how is your vocabulary, how well do you know the Bible? That's not what I'm asking. Is your life transformed? Are you a child of God? Do you know the Christ? Do you live for him? Do people see that you are a child of God? Oh, may it be that all of us in this place would say a hearty amen.
to the words of Jesus Christ. I've been a Christian for many years now. A good number of Christian people are still running the race. But there are a few others who are no longer as enthusiastic as they once were. Some have even repudiated the faith. Of course, we know that those whom God has saved, those he has elected before the foundations of the world, none of them will be lost. And yet, it's possible to have imposters. Has your life changed? If I came to your office or your school or your home and I said, I'm looking for a Christian here, would they be able to say, Ah, Mulanda was born again. John, ah, I was at your Are they going to point at you? Or they will say, A Christian, ah, I can a born again. I think and then you are there and say, no, no, but I'm born again. Uh, born again. Uh, to get it. Jesus says, the one who loves me, Jesus says, if you love me, you will keep and obey my words. I'm not talking about a legalism here, but I'm talking about Amen. Let's pray. Father in heaven, we thank you for your words and uh, the things that you have taught us. Thank you for the claims of Jesus Christ. And we ask that uh, some among us might know the Savior. All of us here might own him as our King. We know that there are others who perhaps are indifferent or do not want to close in with Christ. Oh, we pray that you will speak to them with a voice that works at hand. Amen. Thank you very much.
concerning the Kito chapter prayer request form, which was put on the, on the benches, of which you have to fill in any prayer or thanksgiving items. And then, as you are on your way out, uh, you can give an asha at the door. And uh, this was all the announcement which was left. Shall we just go before we Just God, we humbly come before you, O oh God, we humble from the word which has come clear to our hearing. Lord, the only thing that we have to do is response. Respond, O oh God, with obedience, O oh God. Father God, now as we are about to depart one from another, God, may you your blessing be with us, O oh God. Uh, for we pray and ask for these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Thank you for coming. We are dismissed.